have a Bible, this is what I'd like to ask you to do. Find the book of John, and we're gonna, be in, we're gonna start in John chapter 15. Start in John chapter 15. So you can find that, and as you're, you're getting there, the title of the message this morning is Fullness of Joy. Fullness of Joy. Man, I, I love getting together with God's people. I love Sundays when we gather as a church, when we purpose in our hearts that we're not going to church, but we're gathering as a church. When we show up and we, we greet one another, and, and you know what, there's a lot of smiles, there's a lot of happiness, there's a lot of good things, good conversations that take place. But the truth of the matter is that as followers of Jesus, the joy that we have isn't circumstantial based on the day of the week. Oh, it's Sunday, it's a great day, or oh, I don't have to work today, or oh, the Seahawks have a bye today, or whatever it might be, or oh, we're just still gloating over that Monday night victory over the 49ers. That was a good day, I'm just saying. I, just, I had to work that in somehow. You know, sometimes we get really happy, we get really happy, and then sometimes something else happens, and all that happiness just bursts and it flies away. And you just wonder, where in the world did it go? How did it remove out of my life so quickly. But you know, as followers of Jesus, it's different than that for us. It's different than that for us. We're gonna read a promise and, a, and a, a word of Jesus that talks about what it means to be in his love. And he says things like, to follow me, to put your trust in me, to put your hope in me, your joy is gonna be completely full. In fact, it is gonna overflow. You know, the scriptures are full of so many different promises and descriptions of God's people that are, that are cleansed and put their faith in Jesus Christ that, that joy is one of the chief characteristics and identifiers of a follower of Jesus Christ. And I think some of you should inform your faces of those verses in the Bible. Maybe even right about now. You know, the truth is this, that as followers of Jesus, we have been given so much. We have received more than we could ever imagine receiving in our lives. And the outflow of that, the Bible speaks this word of joy. Joy. What would it look like if every day of our lives was a day of overflowing overflowing in that there's not enough capacity to hold all that there is, joy. Now, oftentimes the word overflowing in our homes is not a good word. You ever have uh, somebody try to, you know, put too much, you know, flush something down the toilet and you go, it's overflowing. If you ever hear that, that's not a good kind of overflow. And sometimes we think of it that way. This last Friday night, it rained so hard. You know, it rained so hard and it just happens to coincide with Almost all the leaves are now down and off the trees. And it, when it rains and it's, your, your gutters are overflowing, the, uh, the, the, the rain, what, what are those things called on the side of the street? What is that? Uh, storm drains are overflowing. We had an experience of overflow just down the front of the driveway into the, the little bit of the foyer on Friday evening as it rained about an inch in 10 or 15 minutes right here at Bothell. It was an exciting time to be around the church, I assure you. And those kind of overflows were like, ah, that's not so good. That's not so good. We don't want waterfalls to overflow. We don't want dams to overflow. We don't want gutters to overflow, toilets to overflow. In fact, there's a lot of things that we don't want to overflow. Can I get an amen? <laughs> All right. But the thing is, we need to open up our heart and mind to this promise that God has called us as Christians to live in a place where joy overflows from our life, where there's not enough capacity within us to hold in that joy. You ever held in joy? You ever hold in joy? You say, you know, I'm really happy, but I don't want people to know it. Huh? Maybe you play card games, and you're like, I got a good hand, and I don't want everybody to know it, so you put on what's called your poker face. I don't play cards, because I don't have a poker face. <laughs> Like if I see something great, I'm gonna let everybody know it. That's awesome, look at me. I'm gonna wipe up over, you guys are going down, Woohoo! And then that doesn't really work out so good, and then that face goes away and it comes a different face. My wife says, you don't play cards because you always lose. And I try to tell her I always lose because you always cheat. And she says, you're a sore loser. And I say, I'm not a sore loser if you would stop cheating. So anyway, that's why when family plays games, I just kinda, I observe and enjoy. You know, when you suppress joy, when you suppress joy, there, there, there comes this part where it actually diminishes joy. But God has called us to live in a place of overflow. What would it look like 
if all of God's faithful followers who have put their faith in Jesus Christ were just overflowing with joy on Monday morning at nine o'clock, overflowing with joy on Tuesday afternoon at two, we're overflowing with joy as students are sitting taking a test, overflowing with joy as we're awaiting a, a doctor's appointment for some news that we're not sure about. We were just simply overflowing with joy. You see, the problem, I believe, is this. We're gonna read the scripture in just a moment, but it's, it's that our concept of joy and what it looks like is more informed by the world and the things of the world than the word and the things of the word. That God wants to put in our hearts and our minds uh, this, the answer to the prayer, God open the eyes of my heart so that I might see what joy really is and not only see what it is, but live it out. Walk in it, receive it, and have you overflowing in it in every circumstance of my life. In every circumstance of my life. John chapter 15, I hope you've found it. Uh, would you stand with me? We're gonna read verses nine through 11 out loud and together. And these are the words of Jesus, the promise of Jesus, the instruction of Jesus. This is the word. This is God's word. And so as we put our voices to this word, I pray that God would let the power of these words be lived out, be absorbed, be reflected, and everything be, uh, be in, bathed in God's word this morning. Are you with me? Come on, let's, let's read out loud and together. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments, and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. And I wanna read that last sentence one more time. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. Father, we receive the words of Jesus and the promise of Jesus. We heard his words today. And he said he told us these words so that we would be filled with his joy. So God, by faith right now, that's what we receive, your joy. We, may we be filled with it. May we overflow. May there not be enough capacity within us to contain all of the joy that you have poured out on your people today. God, apply the truth of your word to every life, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God's good, and we have received. We have received the word of Jesus. Amen. Yeah, come on. I'm just telling you, I'm gonna keep preaching this message until it looks to me like you got it. So some of you just need to just take the poker face off and just go for it. You know, what the scripture tells us here is a lot of things that, that Jesus says, I have loved you. Now, first of all, when we read that, that sentence of Jesus, he says, I have loved you, that should be enough to blow our minds. That should be enough to just take away the sting of any suffering that we have, to know that Jesus, the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Lamb of God, Jesus, the Word of God has said, I love you. We sang here this morning in the sanctuary, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. And there's something powerful about God's people declaring their love for him. But friends, there is something even greater and more powerful when God himself, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, declares his love for us. I mean, love's powerful, right? How many of you need more love in your life? You know, it's what the world needs now. Love. More love. Somebody should write a song about that one there. I'll just, I'll just let you think about that for a minute. You know, love is powerful. But I'm just saying right now, love is a tool. Love is a tool, and whose hand that tool is in determines the amount of power that flows through it. When you and I love well, when we love each other, when we love God, we're doing it out of our capacity and our ability that God has given us. When God loves, when Jesus loves, there is no limit to the capacity. There is no governing, no, no, I, no, no ratcheting down on the love of God. When Jesus says, I have loved you, and I love you, as the Father has loved me, 
there are some powerful truth in there that our hearts need to get a hold of, that something should leap inside of you right there. And Jesus says, I love you. Really? Jesus. Jesus loves me. You know, that's such a, a simple song. Somebody should write a song about that, too. Jesus loves me. How do I know that Jesus loves me? Huh? The Bible, it says it right here. Somebody should, these are, I'm, just, I'm just giving some songwriters good ideas this morning. Oh, either that or I'm, my memory's not so good. But he says this, remain in my love. Remain in my love. Remain in my love. Can you just picture for a moment if there was a face-to-face -face encounter between you and Jesus, and by the way, can I spoil things for a moment? Spoiler alert, there is coming. There is coming a face-to-face -face encounter between you and Jesus. It's that moment when God calls his faithful home to heaven, either by the, the end of our days here on this earth or by the return of Jesus, but one way or another, those who have put our faith in Jesus, we're coming to a face-to-face -face meeting. Friends, just picture that moment, if it were today, if it were here and now, and Jesus, your Savior, who stretched out his arms and died on the cross, a painful death, paying the penalty for our sins. Jesus, who opens the eyes of the blind. Jesus, who forgives those who have, who have just gone so far in life away from God, but their hearts are turning back to him. Jesus, who is full of grace, full of truth. The Jesus that we know and we love and we sing about. If you were standing before him now, and you just said, I don't know what to say to you, Jesus. He says, you don't need to say anything, because I just want you to know. I love you, and I just wanna give you a big hug right now. I just wanna embrace you now. I just wanna tell you that I'm with you, and no matter what happens, I'm always with you, and I'm walking with you in this season. Can you imagine the feeling that would flood your life and your heart to hear those words, not just spiritually to, to read them and receive them by faith, but to hear them in your ears, to hold Jesus right there like the disciples got to hold his hands and look at the scars that were there for you and for me to embrace him and to feel his embrace. The savior of the world, personally loving you, telling you that he loves you. Man, I don't know about you, but that day, I, can't, I, I just can't wait for that day. Another spoiler, you don't have to wait for that day because Jesus just spoke that word over each and every one of us. And when Jesus says, remain in my love, remain in my love, he's calling us to live every moment in such a way that those words, the I love you from the King of Kings, stays in our hearts, in our lives. That as we walk through trial, as we walk through difficulty, as we even endure pain, suffering, hardship, maybe persecution or hatred lobbed at you from others, as we walk through those things, that we wouldn't let those rob or steal the love of Jesus from us, but that we would remain in his love, even in the midst of pain and difficulty, persecution, disease, suffering, sickness, because scripture tells us that none of these things can take us from God's love or can take God's love from us because we're in Christ Jesus. We remain in his love. Did anybody have a weak a week, you know what I mean? You had a week this week. Maybe there were some things that were unforeseen or maybe there were some things that were foreseen. But they attempted to take you out. These circumstances, situations, people, other things just, just were dragging your heart away from the love of Jesus. Friends, I want you to know this right now, that Jesus has spoken over his people and he is calling us to a place of living in what he has spoken. He wants us to remain in his love. And how do we remain in the love of Jesus? Like verse 10 says, by obeying the commands of God. Jesus said, that's how I am in my Father's love, because I've been obedient to his commands. I've loved God with my whole heart. I've loved my neighbor as myself. Jesus spoke obediently when God told him to speak. Jesus saw clearly what God was revealing to him. He wasn't fooled by the deception of the enemy. He wasn't fooled by the feelings or emotions or thoughts of life. But he, he obeyed and he remained in the love of the Father by remaining in the commandments. Jesus says, it's no different for you and I. You want to remain in Jesus' love every day? Yes. Yeah? Me too. Jesus says the key to that is to just stay faithful and remain in the commandments of the Father. The commandments of the Father, it says, love one another. 
That says honor your mother and father. That says don't hate your neighbor. Don't, don't covet other people's stuff. That says, you know, uh, remember the Sabbath. Keep it holy. Honor the Lord in all that you do. That says uh, everything that we have belongs to the Lord. You see, these commands of God, if we live in that way, Jesus says, my love will remain in you no matter what you're experiencing or going through. In verse 11, if we just want to bring up that last part there, he says, I told you all these things. I told you that I love you. I've told you that the Father loves me. I've told you that you need to remain in that love. I told you how I remained in that love, and I told you how you remain in that love, and this is why I've said it to you. This is why I've said it to you. I've told you these things so that you'll be filled with joy. My joy. My joy. Jesus says, I want my joy to fill your life. I want the joy that was set before me to consume, to fill, to overflow. He says, yes, your joy will overflow. Your joy will overflow because Jesus gave you his joy. You know, just a chapter later, Jesus says, ask using my name and you'll receive anything you ask. He says, you haven't done this before to his disciples. I'm teaching you something new. When you ask, Ask in the name of Jesus. Ask in the name of uh, above every name. And then he says this, and you will have abundant joy. That's John chapter 16, verse 24. He says in 1 Peter 1, 8, he says you love him even though you've never seen him. Now he's talking to us, not the disciples, but people like us. I've never seen Jesus with my eyes, but I love him. And I've heard him say, I love you. He says you love him even though you've never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him. And you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. And as the, another song somebody should write about, and the half has never yet been told. As we talk about the joy of God, the joy of Jesus that's given to us, that overflows from us as we remain in his love. Friends, this is how God calls us to live. You know, it's not a matter of positive thinking either. It's not a matter of, okay, I need to put on my game face and smile a lot today because I'm full of joy. I'm overflowing. <laughs> you know, like, it hurts so bad. I'm just gonna smile anyway. It, you know, there, there is something to choose joy, to choose joy, but Jesus says, I'm giving you my joy. And because my joy is in you, you're overflowing. Can, can we just talk about the word joy for a minute? Let's talk about the word joy that's used so many times throughout the New Testament. The New Testament word in, in Greek is the word kara, kara. It literally means joy, but, but as we understand joy, it's not a simple happiness that is, it, it, it describes. It's not a simple contentment of life. It's not just the comfort of life that causes ease. In fact, the word in the New Testament for joy is related to another word in the New Testament, Cairo, which means to rejoice. So it puts a, a verb on there, to rejoice. To rejoice is to make a choice and to proclaim, to speak about the goodness of God. So those words are related. To, to choose to speak of the goodness of God and to have joy, there's a connection and a relation there, but there's another word that's related there, and it's the word charis, charis. And it, it literally means a gift or grace of God. And you know, all three of these words are related to the same root. The grace, the choice to rejoice, and the joy that we have. In other words, joy, as Jesus spoke of it, and as the Bible points us towards, is a state of knowledge and existence and acceptance of the awareness of God's grace that's all over us. When we are aware of how much grace God has given us, what is the result in your life? Are there any former dirty, rotten sinners in the room? You've just got a lot of junk in the trunk and God has forgiven you of that stuff. Anybody else out there? You know who you are, and I'm not saying, that's not a threat, you know, but I'm just saying we know, we know what our lives have been. We know that even the, the things that nobody else has ever heard, they think, oh, you know, you're such a good person, you don't, you this and that. It's like you don't know what God has taken me out of. You don't know the darkness. You don't know the depravity of hu the human condition that, I, that I've tasted and seen. You know, and the truth is when we think about how God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all sin, 
What happens when we think about the sin that we have been forgiven of? Do we start you know, beating ourselves up about how dumb we used to be? Do we start finding others who have those same sins in their lives and start shaming them? Do we become jealous of others who never had those sins in their lives? You see, none of these are the natural result of receiving the true grace of God. When we receive the true grace and forgiveness of God, when we recognize that we who have sinned and fallen short of God's glory are also those who through faith in Jesus Christ have the, hev- had the promise of heaven and the reality of an eternal home with God opened up to us, when we recognize we went from that to this, the result of being aware of God's grace is rejoicing, is a deep, unshakable, unspeakable overflow of the true joy of Jesus. And yeah, it may not always look like a smile from ear to ear. You may not always be running down the aisles, clicking your heels together. It may not be backflips through the aisle at church all the time or down the, down the corridor at work or in the hallways at school because sometimes you're like, I'm thinking about other things, but when we become aware of the grace of God, there is this bubbling up of life, this wellspring of life, of the truth of who we are and who God has called us in spite of that. To be aware of grace is true joy. See, I think that's a good revelation for us to think because if we think that that true joy, that true joy is more about the absence of anything bad in our lives, I mean, how can I be truly joyful if bad stuff's happening in my life? Well, friends, if that is the definition of joy, Jesus was never joyful. Well, if true joy means that there's no fighting or, or nobody in my family that's, that's kind of going sideways, then there again, Jesus never had true joy. If true joy means my body never hurts, that I'm never in need or want of, uh, in my finances or anything like that, that I'm never gonna be sick, if that's the, the qualification for true joy, then Jesus and the apostles and every faithful follower of him for the last 2,000 years has never experienced joy. But when our hearts become aware of the fact that joy is the awareness and living in a state of knowing God's grace, receiving God's grace, living in God's grace, then all of a sudden we say, that's a whole nother game. God, maybe I'm called to live in joy today, be overflowing of joy today. You've given me your joy, and now I'm overflowing with it. I'm overflowing with it. To be aware of grace. This is what we want, to be full of joy, to be full of the awareness of God's grace in our lives. Amen, you grateful for grace? Come on, praise God. God calls us to live in such a way. And as I've been praying over this last week, just asking that God would just pour out this awareness of his true grace in our lives, not in a way that calls us to just say, well, grace is everything, because grace isn't everything. Jesus himself just said, remain faithful and obedient to the commands of God. And that's what, what a true heart who has received grace will walk in obedience it doesn't walk in, in the constant need of more and more grace because we're, we're flaunting sin. We're saying, well, God's gonna forgive me anyways. Friends, if we go on sinning thinking God's gonna forgive us, we've not received grace. We've received something else. We've received a delusion, a lie. We have fooled ourselves about the nature of being transformed by Jesus Christ and faith in him. But friends, when we receive joy, we walk in a different way. And Jesus gives us all that he has for us, and we overflow in abundance of that. And, and the friend, when we receive that joy and that awareness, we begin to walk and see life differently. When we receive an awareness of how much grace we have received, suddenly everything becomes a little more clear, and we see the world and ourselves, and we see the things around us a lot clearer. In fact, when we walk in the fullness of joy, we will have a clear vision for life, and we will have a clear vision of life. When we walk in the fullness of joy, the awareness of grace, we will have a clear vision for life. And friends, this is so critical, so critical, because how you see is how you go. How you perceive is how you proceed. 
And I'm not talking about mental gymnastics here. I'm talking about the clear vision of those who have received the grace of God, who are aware of his grace, who have been forgiven of their sins, who have had the scales of blindness removed from their eyes. When we perceive the world through the eyes of God's abundant grace, through God's call to faithful obedience, we will see everything differently. We'll look in the mirror and we will see a different person. We will look at our friends and neighbors and we will see different people. We will look at our aunt Bertha, no, Gertrude, and we'll see things differently. I apologize for those of you who are joining in the chapel or online and you missed that moment, but we had a word about a hypothetical Aunt Gertrude and how God calls us into opportunities to serve and be kind and love others, even if they're not that way to us. But friends, when we have a clear vision for and of life, we will proceed well. Let me just illustrate this. You ever driven on the freeway lately? How many of you have been driving on the freeway lately? And when you look ahead and you see that the road is clear, there are no red lights in front of you, no tail lights, and you just think things are flowing along at the speed of traffic, and you're proceeding with that that vision in mind. When you see a clear road in front, you you proceed down the clear road. But hopefully, you are perceiving and your vision of that road is clear because when you see brake lights in front of you, you proceed a little different, don't you? When you see a rainstorm coming, when you see conditions changing, when you see the temperature gauge on your car dropping to the freezing or below level, you will proceed differently because you're seeing things clearly, right? And, and you, can, you can be confident and you can proceed with a, a sense of awareness of what might be coming or what's around you and you proceed differently. But here's the danger. When we're not perceiving well, We proceed into danger. We proceed into temptation. And I'm not talking about the freeway anymore. I'm talking about our lives. When we're not looking at ourselves clearly, our circumstances clearly, our neighbors clearly, our own uh, flaws or weaknesses clearly, and we just proceed, you know, and we just say, hey, everything's awesome, everything's good, I don't need to worry about any of that, I'm, you know, grace, 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 and we're thinking of it not in the sense of God's calling us also to obedience, just, whatever, it's all good, and then we wonder why we come and we pray to God every Sunday because we tripped on the same speed bump every week, because we fall into the same temptation every time. Friends, when we proceed into sin, when we proceed into conflict, when we proceed into places where we know we ought not to go, I believe that it is a vision problem. We are not perceiving the the circumstances and realities of our lives in the right way. We're not seeing the dangers, the temptations that the enemy puts right in front of us. We're just walking into a trap. And when we just walk willingly into a trap, it's no surprise that we get caught in that trap. But when we are aware, when we see clearly, when we recognize the cost of the grace that we have received and the power of God's love that is in us, we will be aware and we'll say, God, where are the temptations coming at me this week? God, where are the conflicts that are coming to remove your joy and your presence from my life? God, help me to walk into this conversation, this meeting, this test, this place, this conflict with eyes wide open, not just seeing what is, but seeing it clearly. Do you know there's a difference between seeing what is and seeing clearly? It's true, it's true, and if we can't perceive the difference, we need to ask the Lord to give us a clear vision. You see, friends, it's not just about temptation and sin and weakness that we need to see clearly, it's about the opportunities that God has to bring glory to himself, that he's inviting us into. There's a scripture in Acts chapter 14, and I love it, is, as the, uh, as the apostles, Paul and Barnabas, were on their missionary journey, and they were in the town of Derby, there's a story there that it says here, while they were in Lystra, in Acts 14, verse 8, Paul and Barnabas came upon a man with crippled feet, and he had been that way from birth, so he had never walked. Think about that guy. Think about the way that you're going to see the world, if that's you. Think about the way you're gonna perceive things if you're looking at that. My feet don't work. I've never walked once in my life. You know, your perception of things is gonna be a little different, isn't it? Of what is. Of what is, it's different. But there's something uh, remarkable about this story. He was sitting, and verse nine says, and listening as Paul preached. So Paul's there preaching, sharing the good news. Looking straight at him, Paul realized that he had faith to be healed. 
So Paul called to him in a loud voice, stand up. And the man jumped to his feet and started walking. Now I want you to know a couple things about this story. Number one, it's true, okay? That's a true story, amen? Okay, the second thing I want you to recognize and know about this story is that healing and miracles have from the very beginning of the good news of Jesus been declared on this planet have accompanied the, the preaching of the good news. That healing and the good news are, are like inseparable companions because where there is good news, there is healing. Where there is good news, where the good news of Jesus and the forgiveness of souls and eternity being opened up, there is healing. And so friends, that's why we pray for healing. We believe in healing because it is a part of what Jesus does in the lives of those whose souls belong to him. Jesus heals because it brings glory to God and Jesus exists to bring glory to God. So healing is real. Okay, Can I, I'll just wanna encourage you. Healing is real. If you have even never ever in your life experience physical healing and you've prayed dozens and dozens of times, that's okay. Don't be discouraged by that. Be encouraged by the fact that God is receiving glory through your life and if God heals you physically, that it's just another form of glory. If God em uh, empowers you to live through that difficulty in a way where you still have fullness of joy, it's another way of God receiving glory. But keep asking for the miracles. Keep asking for the healing. Even if you, it seemed like it's been a no, 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 no. I'm just saying, that's how sometimes it goes. We just keep asking because healing and the good news are companions. They go together, amen? Okay, but there's something remarkable about this story that it shows us that as believers, as those who have been given the Holy Spirit of God, whose hearts have been opened, whose eyes have been opened to see things differently, we have an ability to see not just what is, because what is in this story is not good. Got a crippled guy, his feet don't work, he's never walked in his life. That's not a good story. But Paul looks at him and Paul doesn't see what is. Paul looks at him and he looks into this man's eyes and he sees something different. What does he see? You see, Paul wasn't looking at his feet. Paul was listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit that said, that guy's got something different. That guy, even though he's never walked in his life, he has faith to believe the good news of Jesus that you're saying right here and now. That as you're, Paul, as you're preaching about Jesus healing, as Jesus being raised from the dead, as you're preaching about Jesus forgiving sins, this man's believing it. And Paul, seeing what was going on, not in the flesh, but in the spirit, just said, you know what? I think it's time to, to call for a question. He says, guy, do you wanna get up and walk? Stand up, and the guy says, okay. Can you imagine to the shock and amazement of everyone there how much glory God received in that very moment? Why? Because that's what God does. That's who Jesus is. But also because a faithful servant of God was willing to see beyond what is and to perceive what God was doing, to see what the Spirit was doing in that moment. You know, some... some uh, are of the persuasion that stories like this, miracles like this, healings like this, the Holy Spirit leading and guiding believers, those days are over. It doesn't exist anymore. And, and now it's just up to, you know, people who, who love Jesus, which is a good thing, to just kind of abide and make up stuff. But friends, I, I'm here to tell you, this is how God works today. God opens the eyes of those who are sharing good news to see beyond what is. God opens the eyes of those who are in tough places, whose, whose feet don't work, if you will, to just believe and trust that God is able to bring glory and healing in lives. This happens today. Here's what I wanna ask, that each of us would have hearts, not only to be full of joy, but as we receive that joy and aware, are aware consistently of that grace, that God himself would speak to us and, and give us perception of what he is doing. That we wouldn't simply look at a crowd of people. We wouldn't simply look at somebody across the table and just see the shirt they're wearing, see the color of their eyes, see the style of their hair, hear the words of their stories, but God would give us a deeper perception into what's really happening. To what's really happening. You know, there are a couple instances, even this week, where the Lord was reminding me of these. I was praying with a friend who was in a very difficult circumstance with a family member, 
And as we were praying over this, as we were praying, I, I just felt like the Lord encouraged me to say, you know what, as you're talking to your family member, I want you, to, and, and he and I were praying over distance, I just said, be bold and ask, and, and just, just make, be bold and pray boldly over your family member who's far from God. I said, I don't know, like, because it's been a sensitive situation. You know, and I got an email later this week, and he just said, praise God, you know, something was different. As you encouraged me in that, you know, I just, and I don't, I'm not saying that this is anything to do with me. I said, the Lord just put it in my mind, in my heart, and I said, I think I see something different is happening here. It's not just like it's always been every other visit, every other time. I think God is opening up a door. I think God is opening up a heart. And to hear the results when we walk in faithfulness to that, when we walk in faithfulness to that, another circumstance where the Lord just kind of gave me, a, a, again, a insider perception into a different, and I said to somebody, hey, go, go lightly on this, because I think God's doing something here. And they said, okay, you know, a couple hours later, they came back and said, hey, wow, you gotta, see what, you gotta hear what God's doing. This is what's happening. Friends, this is how God speaks to his people. This is how those who are aware of grace, you and I, are called to live every day. Not as like magicians, you know, summoning magic rabbits out of our hats, but just as faithful people who are willing to listen to what God says, to perceive and proceed rightly. How many of you desire that type of vision for life, that type of vision for the circumstances around us? Amen. You see, when we live that way, we have authority over our thoughts and feelings. We're not enslaved to our thoughts and feelings. When we see clearly, we recognize that we're not a slave to anything or anyone but Christ Jesus. That we belong to him, that we follow him, and we gladly, we gladly walk into life obeying him. You know, all of this leads us to a place like Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12 verse two speaks of Jesus and the joy that he had. The joy that Jesus had. You see, I believe that, that when we have a fullness of joy and a clarity of vision, for and, and of life, that we walk into what I believe is the mind of Christ that exists in all believers. When we allow and we dwell upon and we're aware of what God is doing, we can walk through the circumstances of life that don't dictate our joy, but the circumstances of life that are transformed by the joy of Jesus in us. Hebrews 12, two, the second half of it says this, because of the joy awaiting him, and the him in this case is Jesus, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Because of the joy awaiting him, Jesus says, there is joy in front of me. There is joy before me. It has been set in front of me. My eyes are fixed on it. And no matter what I'm walking through, no matter what pain or suffering, the death of the cross, Jesus says, I'm walking right through that because there's joy right in front of me. You see, when the clarity, Jesus' clarity of his mission in life was such that no pain, no abandonment from the closest friends of his life, no need, no fear, no intimidation or lies of the enemy could dissuade him from having his eyes fixed on the joy that had been set before him. Let me bring this full circle because as we consider what was the joy set before Jesus? Friends, the joy set before Jesus was you and I, the ones whom he loves, that John 15 tells us he loved us. For God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son. And Jesus loved us so much that he willingly endured the scorn, the shame, the pain of the cross. And it was counted all as joy. You see, that's what a true vision of life will accomplish for us. That's what real perception of God's glory will translate into. That's what fullness of joy that can't be robbed looks like Jesus himself. Jesus himself.